Welcome to Critical Mass TV. This is not another Me Too show designed to soften you up for a bunch of commercials. If we were just repeating a bunch of someone else's work, we wouldn't even do it. The most user-friendly definition of critical mass is the minimum number of people it takes to change the world. Let's get it on. We have three segments to each show. I on the greed cult, commentary by Brad, yours truly, followed by the art break with Kathy Hartley, which features a regional artist, musician, or creative genius to inspire us to reach high. Lastly will be Voices Vermont, an interview with outstanding local people making a difference for the right reasons. Call me Brad, and it's on to the eye. So, I hope everyone's well. Years ago, something occurred to me. For, for most of human history, the larger the group, the more the group tended towards being dominated by a very few of its most aggressive members. And in that basic dynamic lay all the negative things that plague our societies to this day. No social, economic, and political example exists that isn't authoritarian and top-down with threat, intimidation, and fear as the stick to enforce this core. Now the good news. Despite this brutal reality, we have not only survived this shit, we have thrived. We have one of the ugliest forms of domination and control woven into our very social fabric. But we are so adaptable, intelligent, and caring of one another that we triumph over greed in countless ways. Just imagine for a second if we empowered ourselves to plan our own work, social, and spiritual relationships together to form a vigorous politics, the never-ending struggle for power, politics. Because we are all now marginalized, this struggle is only between greed cult factions dancing for dominance. But just imagine if we weren't led around like children but had a large seat at the table. Hmm. Begin at the beginning. We will be about a lot of things. Some good, some great, some worrisome, and some hideous. But mostly will treat every issue discussed with honesty, integrity, and perspective. And I, I just can't help some humor and sarcasm. It's kind of like coffee, the only therapy that always works every time. I mean, come on. If this shit wasn't funny, it would just be true. Now, before you begin tweeting everyone you know about this awesome new show, or frantically pushing buttons on your remote to find something, anything else to smooth out the wrinkles on your brain, let me promise that whining and moaning about all the conventional crappiosis is not what we're about. Of course, we need to look at the way things work, who benefits and who pays, the economy, 
politics, culture, but we will only analyze enough structure to make our solutions, positive directions, and courses of action more clear. Secondly, we need to not just stop the spin. We need to counter-rotate that spin like a revolutionary boomerang and send it right back at the institutions that own the society and milk it for their narrow short-term gain. What I can also promise is that I can prove everything I say. The preponderance of the evidence always illustrates the truest argument. And one of the primary reasons for the obviously manufactured, polarized nature of the bipartisan leadership that we have is to confuse and distract regular people from these basic truths. Wow, I mean, I'm getting long-winded and self-righteous already, but I, I just can't help it. So eventually, when we go live, you can call me. And I really want you to call in and tell me I'm right or wrong or give me your own spin on stuff and give me your perspectives. You can call and offer productive criticism. Um, that would probably be most effective. And show your interest and involvement. This will be a call-in show. And hopefully, as we grow more fond of each other, we can get some good give and take going on. The long and short of it is, I'm just going to keep talking to myself, but I will answer anything if it has to do with life and living, even better if it pertains to something we are discussing. But, um, but as you will see, I'm not too picky. What is the beginning? There are two different stories that I will attempt to tell, and therefore two beginnings. One involves the world as it is. Sometimes depressing, yes, but instructive and important to understand. The second is the possibilities that lie in alternative ways of organizing our work and communities and leadership equations. What we need, um, just as a group of people, and especially young people, is intellectual self-defense. How to identify constructive, predominantly true information, and how to, how to tell it apart from manipulative, extractive thought control that's designed mostly to benefit other people besides yourself. So that leads into um, that probably the most important thing we, that needs to be worked on uh, is a multi-layered communication network centered around participation. Broadcast TV and internet live streaming, including all progressive websites and news sites, directories and links. Many people, myself included, aren't able to hunt and peck hundreds of different sources, if not thousands, to build an idea and of honest information. We need some cohesive sources that we can trust, which is what a responsible commercial or public media would actually consist of. And then a major framework that we need to develop is economic and political parallelism. And what I mean by that is if anyone travels to New York City and you actually see the size and the scope and the power of multinational corporations and Wall Street, and if, you, and if, you, if you're standing there and you watch a bunch of fighter jets fly over and you watch a, a giant US Navy vessel sailing out to sea, you realize that realistically none of that stuff is going anywhere in the short term. Um, but in touch participatory political groups driving change 
can have a, a serious impact on what those institutions do, how they react, and how they respond to us as regular working people. Just a few ideas, community-based banking and insurance, working partner owner or WPO corporations, highly democratized, WPO or working partner owner infrastructure organizations, seeding and maintaining future transportation, distribution, and commercial networks, all other groups wanting to work to common purposes and individuals wanting to work towards common purpose, driving change, in affecting, um, innovating effectively, excuse me, and, and uh, implementing our own constructs to parallel the long established constructs that are highly extractive of our communities. If you can't beat them, beat them. And let me say that again. If you can't beat them, beat them. And I mean at their own games. All Wall Street parasites, all fossil fuel energy megaliths, all warmonger death manufacturers are poised and ready for most contingencies. They've been working on contingency planning for a long time. What they can't handle is being ignored. It's the worst possible thing that could happen to them. And bypassed, made obsolete by the common sense of common purpose. For starters, everything around us is built around frameworks. From the simplest human concept to the busiest natural system, it's helpful to realize that everything is understandable if we identify the frame and supports and contrast and, and the context that it exists within. Here's an example using us since that what I mean since that's what you know we should understand is us. So pretend there's a journalist from Beta Centauri. While knowing her own culture, she knows nothing of ours. As a probably a superior being since she was able to travel from Beta Centauri to Earth. She's also like miraculously able to remain impartial. Most people, when asked, will tell her that society, um, that society and our government and our culture, et cetera, are broken and that the U.S. is in decline and so on. Right away, before forming an opinion, our interstellar investigator looks at the hidden in plain sight social dynamics that these opinions and ideas originate from. For thousands of years, every large group of humans and all they possess has been entirely owned by only one or two percent of the group's members. <clears throat> this ruling minority is the group's elite, and their goal is always money and power. Somehow this tiny bunch uses its neighbors like a mining operation and extracts as much wealth as it possibly can. Hopefully, and I say hopefully, without collapsing the village, city, nation state, or kingdom that they live in. In many situations, past and present, this is accomplished by threat and intimidation. Give me what I want, or you are tortured, <laughs> your family's persecuted, or you're going to die. In more sophisticated systems, like those in industrialized areas, this becomes problematic because even with a background of fear and disconnectedness, Given the resources and the chance, people resist this kind of domination. And they resist it sometimes very ag aggressively. So out rolls the thought control mechanism, which replaces brute force and like threat and intimidation. So the thought control mechanism 
which is around us at all times. It controls people's behavior by limiting what they realize is possible. You don't know what you've never heard. People can be tricked quite easily to support structures that are counter to their obvious self-interests. Both of these constructs are domination and control mechanisms being orchestrated by repression apparatus. Our impartial observer would see today corporate capitalist mega companies with absolute, unchallenged, and almost unchecked power rooting and rutting like a giant undead mega hog at the trough of what the rest of us see as our communities. Since this framework has evolved over thousands of years, everyone is in on it. <clears throat> Business, industry, banking, insurance, the entire political class, which is merely an extension of big business, um, primary schools, high schools, universities, colleges, and the corporate media work together with an unwritten charter to indoctrinate, over-specialize, distract, discourage, and belittle us to keep us from our actual designed purpose. And yeah, we do have a designed purpose. We are mammals existing on this planet. We are space creatures actually flying through space right now. So yes, yeah, space creatures do exist. So our designed purpose is to organize among ourselves um, and counteract exploitation and leverage fairness against the inevitable greed cult that always tends to form at the top of human social structures. She would quickly see massive evidence to support this analysis. Look at the power of Wall Street banks before and after the global collapse caused by large-scale gambling with people's pension funds, residential mortgages, etc. Anyone else, this would be criminal behavior. And you would, you would go to jail and you would be prosecuted. Not only was this most massive fraud in history instantly bailed out by a supposedly broke federal system. I mean, how many times have you heard that we're all running out of money and not, we have no money for anything anymore? No one or thing was publicly investigated, prosecuted, or even timidly re-regulated to protect us from a recurrence of this obviously criminal behavior. Not only that, but even more, Wall Street executives were installed in Obama's administration. I think there's at least six at the very highest levels of Obama's administration, Wall Street executives, to ensure that exactly nothing is done without the express approval of these massive parasitic wealth enhancers. They are literally insured in their criminal behavior by the federal government. I mean, who else has that kind of insurance policy? I know my little business opportunities have no insurance. If I fail, if I gamble and I fail, I'm absolutely done. I mean, there is no backup support, which is, of course, pure corporate socialism. Remember, with each successive bubble burst and crash, power and wealth get entrenched while people suffer and become weaker and more disillusioned. And it's boom and bust. It's boom and crash and boom and crash. We could go over and we will go over um, several of these cycles that have happened just in the last you know, 10, 15 years. So the present system that is fragile at best for working people, while multi-trillion dollar institutions are subsidized by corporate welfare, is not just perpetuated, but strengthened and made more impenetrable to even basic oversight and balanced regulation. She would see that between 27 and $40 trillion of private wealth has been stashed away in the Cayman Island havens, banking havens alone in a gigantic tax dodge by the super rich 
And these people are primarily U.S. and European citizens. Incomes for working people have been declining since 1970. And I mean, yes, incomes have been declining since 1970. While, the pro while our productivity, or the productivity of American workers, has been um, basically growing at a very robust rate. So our incomes have been declining, but our productivity has been expanding. Corporate profits and executive salaries have increased hundreds, if not thousands of percent. Guess who doesn't want to share and is rigging the entire system for their own benefit? So the, the difference between the declining wages of the American worker since 1970 and productivity, that difference in those two lines, the declining wages and increasing productivity, that space through time in dollar amount, in, in, do, in dollars, that is the 27 to 40 trillion dollars that has been squirreled away and stashed in offshore tax havens. I mean, who can get away with that? So she would marvel at the ingenuity of the exploiters and the susceptibility of the rest of us. I, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question now. Why do you think there is no labor section in the New York Times? Think about that for a minute. There, in every publication and on every network, there's business show after business section after business show. Why is there no labor section, no consumer section, no meaningful activism section, no unfiltered political shows on TV, and a supposed liberal media that's owned by the most conservative corporations in the world? Um, not one article or program illustrating how people can organize together to bring collective force into the power equations that surround us. Not one single show. And I will, ex I will exempt Bill Moyers, who was a national hero, and in his courage and intestinal fortitude on public TV, which is under constant assault on PBS. Moyers and Company is one of the most brilliant and courageous shows out there. So I will give him an incredible pass. Um, that is politics, this endless, never-ending struggle for power. Most of us do nothing or fight voraciously against our own self-interest. She knows politics is the never-ending struggle for power. She will document that these ruling elites are so entrenched that they are never going away but how with a few simple steps, the expendable majority could not only get a seat at the table, they could even order dessert. She sees how the elites are actually quite fearful. And, ex and the example of that is the lack of a labor section in the New York Times. That's not just so we are not, so as I said before, you don't know what you've never heard, but that actually is an example of fear. Um, they're very, very afraid at high levels of, of us actually organizing and working together. They know that an educated, motivated, Arab Spring-like uprising could mean the end of absolute corporate domination. <clears throat> the ruling classes, by their omission of the obvious, uh, by their obvious omission of the obvious, show their weaknesses. If large numbers of people prod these faults, the greed cult stumbles. If you aren't supposed to organize out of the mainstream, you organize. If you can't get any information besides watered down crap run through corporate filters, you build your own media and information systems. If you're getting financially raped by Wall Street and its cronies, you build community-based nonprofit banking and financial services. If the federal system is rotten to the core with influence peddling, corporate welfare, militarized insanity, the organized working people should exercise their obvious constitutional duties to disassemble it and restructure it with more sustainability 
and anti-royalist and corporatist safeguards. I mean, really, honestly, and I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, and I don't mean to seem superior or holier than thou, but this is seventh grade social studies stuff. Sixth grade, possibly, or fifth grade. She will conclude that there is a desperate need for intellectual self-defense for the people, some mixed mental arts training beginning early on so folks can tell propaganda and manipulation from good information and empowerment. For an eternity, we have been conspired against by what I call the hallucinati, an elite that is hallucinogenically out of touch but so large that is not, it's not technically conspiratorial. It's mainstream. It is a shapeshifter that can be grabbed by the tail and made to halt its mono-obsessive service of power. <clears throat> Traumatic stress. Traumatic stress. We hear about traumatic stress a lot in reference to soldiers returning from occupations abroad. It is real, all too real for the individual suffering from it. It is also what's happening to American society. The demonizing, warmongering, and ceaseless pushing of the fear button is wearing us thin. But have hope, always have hope. We survive in spite of all this pressure and greed. I mean, think about it. For so long, we survive in spite of all the pressure and greed. If we were not so basically good and adaptable, we would already be long gone. This is the proof that we need to build our courage. So let's begin at the beginning. From there lies a logical progression of communication and action and analysis that is 100% doable. As we converse over the next months, we will delve into our psychology, our triumphs and tribulations, our incredible potentialities and our incredible, well, adversaries. When we shed light on the truth, the poetry humbles itself in the af afterglow. We need to grapple with the next obvious level of nonviolent resistance. That is to convert reactionary resistance into actually controlling the key centers of our lives and living and not contract it out. We can do it. It's easily imagined, and the evidence is all around us of our limitless potential. Each show will require some time spent with me. I know uh, everyone always has that same reaction. Oh, man, here goes Brad again. Um, my wife is just commenting about that, I'm sure. We will welcome an artist from among us to play paint, pander, or proselytize, and somehow expand our perceptions and make us fuller. Finally, we'll discuss issues from the local and greater world with an invited guest. So please spread the word. This is a plea from me to you. In the final analysis, the future of humanity pivots on communication and control of information. Cable access TV is already in every home in the United States, or almost. Let's use it before we lose it. A network of the ultimate and reality TV could be the wedge that breaks through the propaganda ceiling, the one that covers all of us and is always thickening. Hey, the cable companies are even paying for this miraculous possibility. Think about it then, and call me and tell me how we can bust it loose. Critical Mass TV, a grassroots roadmap for positive change.
all about honesty and honorableness, intelligent integrity, and a perspective of progress. Everyone claims these qualities. Let's, um, let's see if we can make a difference. Remember, none of the triumphs of working people over the last 140 years was spontaneously enacted by governments. Child labor laws, women's suffrage, the labor movement and progressive politics, civil rights movement and gay rights movements, the environmental movement, anti-nuke, anti-war, peace movements, New Deal, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, Occupy, the economic and political justice movement, they all gained traction with the action of people in the streets demanding change, and all were viciously fought by so-called conservatives. Some more effective than others, but all are lessons to be learned. All right, now I am the heavy, and now we'll have the light. So here is Kathy Hartley and Hoff the Harmonica Man. and welcome to Art Break. Um, in this segment, you will meet artists, musicians, writers, chefs, and various fun, inspirational, creative, and talented people. You probably know that a musical instrument needs a case to carry it in and to protect it. I'd like you to meet a man who plays harmonica and has taken the case to a whole new level. This is Bob Hoffman. He's better known as Hoff, the harmonica case man. Hoff, welcome. Thank you so much, Kathy. To Art Break. Um, so you have an amazing collection of harmonica Not only cases. amazing, if I may be so bold, the world's largest collection the world's of largest. individually handcrafted harmonica cases as documented. And how many do you have, do you think? Uh, right now I have 450. Um, which I've collected over the last eight years, and I'm on my goal to reach 500 by next summer when my book will come out. And you're going to have a book yes. printed. Yes, exactly. Showcasing all your harmonica cases. Yes, it will, and I've already decided, by the way, if I may say so, the cover of the book, and my eight-year-old grandson, Dimitri, is very happy because his case, right. the one he made for me, which is this one right here, as you can see, all constructed out of Legos, with the harmonica in the back. That's Constructed beautiful. by my eight-year-old grandson. That's that, great. It, regardless of all of the other famous artists I have here, this ends up on the cover of the book. Nice. I love it. Very colorful, beautiful yep. cover. Nice. So what other cases do you have that you'd like Well, to the show? first case ever, just so I can start that you with made, that, yeah, that, that, was that I received. And the way this works is that I have uh, designed all of the cases, and then I have different crafters from around the world. Uh, so a lot from Vermont, I'm happy to say, who then work with me on the design and then craft the cases for me, and I commission them to do these things. I see. So, for example, the, uh, the first one ever, first which started one. eight years ago, eight years when, ago. The, when the collection began, is this beautiful beaded one. As you see, beautiful. I met a, uh, a woman from Iowa at the uh, Smithsonian Craft Show. I live in Washington, D.C., nine months a year. I live three months a year in Vermont. Right. So when I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the Smithsonian Craft Show, and this phenomenal beater made me this beautiful case. Uh, all of the cases, as you see, have my name on the back. Right. So beautiful bead work with beautiful. the name Hoff on the back. And this is what actually started the collection number one. Nice. And then? And then what happened is, to be honest with you, I wasn't planning on doing a collection. Now, if I'm wearing this case with this outfit, it looks kind of good. Yes, and it I, does. I thought that would be fine. But then about a week later, I went out and I was wearing an outfit that was more blue and purplish. And I put this on, and it was a uh, uh, harmonica case fashion faux pas. Right, a risk, fashion So I risk. went back to this woman, and I said, make me one that had more blue and purple Ooh, in it. That's so beautiful. this is case number two that she made, wow. that uh, also with my name on the back out right. of beadwork. Beautiful. She does and that's great just, work. Yes, she does. Nice. And that's just the bead ones that started. But then, if, as you can see, I've used uh, metal and rubber and wood and right. glass and plastic Let's every other take kind a look that at does some it. more of those uh, i'll show you one let me show oh 
If I may show you one, you may. me, this is, uh, I, I'll have to admit that when you met me uh, last year and you were enamored with my collection, yes. you agreed to make me one. <laughs> and I'm going to show the one they that were I brought with me I had to. that you made me one. I said to you, please, since I'm in, since I'm in D.C., nine months a year, I want to be able to think of Vermont all year long because I love Vermont. Right. And I can't live up here full time because I've got a wife and kids and stuff back home in D.C. But you made me the case that makes me think of Vermont all year long, which is my famous Vermont barnwood case. You lift the little roof off, and there is the harmonica there it is. housed right inside. And as I like to tell people, since I've been showing this around the country, it's protected all year long by the famous Vermont barn oh, cow patrol right, right the cows and if the cows want to come out of the barn can they, they can yes they can i will leave them in yep. there for now but they can come out through their portable they can come out and but then they close the up and they're there <laughs> so there that's my famous vermont barnwood case i like <laughs> well, that well i love that one in yes. particular <laughs> there are a couple other vermont so artists many. around if i may show you a couple absolutely uh, you what may have you may know uh, stacy mincher also known in town as the zipper the lady zipper lady she's amazing and she has made me this all zipper nothing but zipper case Gorgeous. Uh, with a beautiful harmonica emblazoned on the front out of zippers. Gorgeous. Uh, I told her the name has to be this, so of course she put a beautiful hoff on the back she of the is case. Amazing, yeah. It is a phenomenally beautiful case with the harmonica housed okay. right inside there. And this one is good because it can be worn in Vermont during the daytime when it's nice and hot. You can keep it down, but in the evening when it gets a little cooler, can you can zip, zip it up. up. That's great. For full effect. <laughs> Very Vermonty. Yes, that is Vermonty. So it's got <laughs> full flexibility on it, That's which wonderful, is great. Wonderful, wonderful. So I like that case a lot. Yes, absolutely. You may have, you may know Aaron Stein. He's a local Burlingtonian artist who does things out of license plates. Right. This is a famous Aaron Stein uh, license plate harmonica case holder with a big H for Hoff on the front. Wonderful. Uh, he's also making another case now as we speak. Oh, good. Uh, another Vermont artist that is uh, very well known, I think, in Burlington is Beth Robinson. Yes, with Who has dolls. a couple of strange dolls, strange exactly. Strange dolls, yes. yes. She's got some cool stuff. She does. And here's uh, two dolls that uh, harmonica cases she made me. One, the kind of uh, Living Dead, Night of the Living Dead right. case, which has the skeleton in her own bizarre doll way. And to make it a little worse, a guillotined head <laughs> housed the harmonica right inside there. Right. It's where it's held. And you see the name on the front. And yeah. then just to scare the children, if that wasn't bad enough, she did on the back of this case a very nice Beautiful. Uh, clown face yes. that keeps people scared all uh -huh. the time. Note the harmonica That'll in the hand of the doll. That'll keep people away from that. Harmonica yes. in the hand. So that's a beautiful Beth Robinson the case. The details. The devil is in the details. And the devil is in that detail right there. <laughs> and then, as you see, she can mellow it out with a beautiful doll here that she made with oh. the, uh, in the backpack is the harmonica, <gasps> a small harmonica in the hands of the doll. And this is also, all of these are wearable. Every case you can wear over your head, as the ones I'm wearing here now. Uh, this one here is made out of chain mail. Beautiful. All chain mail, name on the back of the case. This is from Guatemala. I have a number of international cases. Right. This is one from Guatemala. Uh, from San nice. Marcos with my name on the back Your of name. that. And this one, uh, I'm proud to say, I just got it this week. So that's one of your newest ones? Newest one. Okay. Uh, I just got it from a, a <gasps> phenomenal young guy. It says Hoff on the bottom. It says Hoff on the bottom. Beautiful jeweled work here. Gorgeous. It's really nicely done. Very nicely done. Yes. You know a lot of craftspeople. I do. I do. They're just um, works of art. They're just gorgeous works of art. Yes. Now, if I may say something about my new grandson yes 10 month old do. grandson congratulations and i want to show you two harmonica cases that are themed around the birth of my grandson okay case number one okay here we go is dun, 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 dun. the famous baby <gasps> bottle harmonica <laughs> case and as you can see his name is ethan yeah this is done in bead work and there's me hoff oh and there of course in this beaded baby bottle which is really disguising because of course it is a Wow. harmonica case holder in disguise. Is this made by the same woman that yes, did the first one? Yes, that is. Ah, and then uh, I had a picture taken of myself and my grandson playing the harmonica, even though he's only 10 months old. He'll be playing it. He will be soon, <laughs> I hope. And I went to a sculptor friend of mine, and she made me this case, oh, wow. which, as you can see, is a wooden sculpture Ooh. of myself and my grandson Beautiful. carved out of wood. It says on the 
uh, you see the acorn hats on their hat, oh, right. hats here. Oh, Very good. And uh, Hoff and Ethan on the back. Oh, that's gorgeous. And this is one of my favorite new yes, cases that I'm beautiful. sure my grandson gets old enough will be able to appreciate Very the artistic work on this one. So that's a really that's a new, fabulous yes. one that we have here. So that's one of your newest ones. That is. Yeah. That's about a month old on right. that one. Right. Okay. What else have you got over well, there? Well, I have a, a, a bunch of ones I'm now developing that are kid-friendly. Because when I do my exhibits uh, and shows, I notice a lot of kids coming over. And so even though some of these are fragile, I have a whole section that's not that fragile and they're fun. Right. So for example. Interactive. Interactive. Nice. Here's one that's a good example. This is uh, the only one in the world, I believe, which is a combination, except for the other one that I have by the same person, <laughs> uh, a, a combination of a harmonica case holder. And if you look through this part of the harmonica case and turn that wheel, that's you will see cool. that it is also a beautiful yes. kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope. So it's That's a kaleidoscope so harmonica it case holder. Beautiful. Where are you going to find that in the store, my Nowhere. friend? Nowhere. Nowhere. No. You There's have no. the only one in the world. I have the only one <laughs> that is like that. Um, uh, they're just amazing works of art. Every thank you. single one of these. This one and another. Uh, the kids like this one too. This is made out of, um, let's see, various recycled parts of upcycled yes. work. And right. as you can see, there are keys on the mm -hmm. side. Uh, all sorts of metal pieces, and the way this one works it's is like a mechanical man. You open up, pull up the harmonica like that, the little harmonica that's in there, right. and then that reveals, of course, Beautiful. the large harmonica inside. Wow! And he's even smiling. Well, he's supposed to look like me a little bit. He looks a lot like you. <laughs> that's great. That's I do. Really I do have a number of ones that look like me, uh, just because I want to have a couple of those themes. And you see, this one here yes. is out of mosaic glass. And this one also has a good sense of looking like right. a good harmonica player like me. Very nice. Yes, made. if I if I put a harmonica in my mouth, and they're all like easy that. to take the yeah. harmonica right out of yes, the case, exactly. so you can just play it. Easy to play. Very neat. Um, any, let's any see. I can show you. Oh, since you mentioned mechanical, yeah, I'm going to show you one that is made by a friend of mine from California. Okay. This one has a little bit of uh, kinetic energy to yes. it. Yes. Oh, look uh, at and that. as you can see, it's kind of got that steampunk look love to it. it. Love it. And uh, the trick on this one is that the harmonica goes back in here. Right. So there we have the harmonica in right. the steampunk case. Yeah. And small harmonica here, musical note there. And with a little bit of turning, Ooh, we turn that. Very creative. And you see that it has a little bit of movement to oh, it with the that's great. harmonica that's turning genius. and the thing turning. And I'm pleased to say we designed it so that I can wear it against the chest <laughs> without yes. any uh, chestal interference. Right. <laughs> very good. So that's good. very good on that Very one. good. So All those details are very important. That one works there. <laughs> uh, this is a woman, a local woman in town, uh, Sarah Jumonville, worked Ooh. over on Pine Street when she made this. And she made me the famous uh, harmonica case trap, as I tell the kids. You put the harmonica food back in here. Ah. The harmonica comes along unsuspectingly. Boom. Bam. And next thing you know, harmonica case. Trapped. Boom. That's great. That is great. <laughs> I love it. That's one like that. Uh, <laughs> this is one by a local artist, Terry Zygmunt, who does beautiful glass work. She's well known for her tree work. So this is beautiful yes. glass work with uh, trees on it right. out of wire. Beautifully done. Very nice. She's, uh, as am I, she can be found at the farmer's market, mm -hmm. uh, the Burlington Farmer's Market every Saturday where she at sells. At City Hall Park? At City Hall Park, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, great. And, so and you're I, there every Saturday? I'm there every Saturday during the summer. Terry's there um, a lot. I'm right. there. I'm only here from end of June to Art Hop, right. which, as you know, is mid, uh, second week of September. Right. So, um, uh, but I'm showing every Saturday my cases of a different variety each week okay. of uh, cases at the we Art Hop. We probably have time to look at just a couple more. A couple more? I'll show you, what will I show you? I'll show you a, a couple more Vermonters, I guess. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, this is Mags Bonham. She's a Vermonter out of polymer clay. Oh, that's a beautiful. A beautiful case I like that. I have earrings by her, I yes. believe. Yes. <laughs> she does a lot of good work. Uh, maybe one this is a case one. made out of um, antler? antler and Ooh, copper. Gorgeous. And that one. So you can is, make a harmonica case out of just about anything yes, if you, you can. put oh, your mind to and it. Oh, and I'll close with these two. Okay. All right. This one, 
that my wife has told me is just a little bit too much of Hoff on this one, but nonetheless, oh, that's I show great. you this piece of clay <gasps> artwork that is It's Hoff, like looking at two of you. Or three of me. <laughs> three of you, look at that, that's great. That's so there great. you see the famous Hoff, mini if, Hoff. Yeah, if you just can't get enough Hoff, you, there you go. Yeah. That's great. Oh, and, th those are beautiful. And lastly, here okay. it is, the, the closing one. This is a Felter out in oh. Winooski, and she did a beautiful case of myself and my grandson, and grandson. playing the harmonica together with the harmonica oh, in the back goodness. with my name there. And this is one of my She's new favorites. She's captured you beautifully. And my grandson, too. beautiful. Both yes, I love it. Harmonica. Love it. Very nice job. Thank you so much. Yes, you can. People who want to see it can come every Saturday to the Farmers Market. It'll also be at Art Hop on at Pine Street. Art Hop on, on September sixth and seventh, Friday and Saturday. Okay, there. and the Art Hop is an amazing yes. thing to go observe and see all the different artists. And you'll be. Do you know where you'll be setting up? I'll be in Conant Metal and Light. Okay. On, right on, uh, right on Pine. Pine Street. Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Hoff. Um, if you'd like to be my guest on Art Break, uh, the Gmail is artbreakvermont at gmail.com and I would love to be able to show more artists and musicians, chefs, any creative person. I would love to interview you and um, as long as you're local, we would love to show what you do. And thank you very much. That wraps it up for Art Break. Thanks, Kathy. Back over to Brad. Thank you very much, Hoff. Thanks, you guys. That was just incredible. Hoff, I love fun. that stuff. Thanks, Brad. I hope you move through 200 more this year, at least 50. <laughs> All right, now it's time for Voices Vermont, and I would like to introduce Carmen Soleri. Come on in, Carmen. So Carmen is the Fair Trade Program Director at the Peace and Justice Center of Burlington? Yes, of Vermont, actually. Of Peace and Justice Center Vermont. of Vermont. Fantastic. And didn't you tell me that the Peace and Justice Center is celebrating 30 years of activism? Yeah, we've been going strong since 1979. So wow. We've been doing a lot of really I great remember things. 1979, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> well, great. That's incredible. And I personally respect and really love the Peace and Justice Center, all the different programs that you are active in, and your, and your store, too, is just outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. So, Carmen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Peace and Justice Center is about, and, um, and we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. So we've been responding to community needs since 1979, so we've been doing a lot of a lot of things, and I think a lot of people know us for a lot of different things. So yeah. right now, I can, I can talk about a few programs that we have going on. Sure. Because we do, we're covering a lot of things in the community right now. Um, so our biggest campaign is the Cost of War series. The Cost of War series is a speaker and film series. So our, our biggest series is the Cost of War series, which is a speaker and film series. Um, we've been bringing huge names to the Burlington community to talk about the implications of war, the different manifestations that um, war creates. So we brought Bill McKibben, Chris Hedges, um, Medea Benjamin, who is a really awesome woman. Um, so that is our biggest program that we have running right now. Yeah, that's a large undertaking and critically, critically important. Mm -hmm. And then the one that has gotten recently a lot of media attention is the livable wage campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, Skinny Pancake just got an exemption um, for the community, um, for the livable wage ordinance that the Peace and Justice Center instated. So we are working at their, to- At their, their new um, restaurant that's in the Burlington International Airport, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we are working to um, make sure that that is instated everywhere. Um, which is important. Like consistently enforced consistently. across all the different contractors that work for the city. Exactly. Isn't that correct? Exactly. Because it's kind of it's kind of useless if it's not you know uniformly enforced. Because mm -hmm. they'll just keep 
exemption after exemption after exemption will, will, will be what happens and you'll be right back to making 772 exactly. an hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then another campaign that we have is the Fair Trade campaign, which is the campaign that I'm personally responsible for. Mm -hmm. And so we have a store, which is the economic justice project of the center. So our store has fair trade and local gifts in it. And then we most recently had a cocoa campaign, which is an offshoot of the fair trade campaign, trying to raise awareness about the unfortunate presence of child labor in the cocoa industry. So 70% of the chocolate that's imported into the United States actually is child labor, mostly coming from Ghana and the Ivory Coast. So we worked with local producers um, and importers, trying to get them to divest from um, coffee suppliers who are, I mean, sorry, chocolate suppliers who are right. working with. That's kind of the, you know, one, one of the points I was making earlier is that even just as we go about our regular lives, we don't realize that when we're buying chocolate, even, even from a very reputable um, local, you know, uh, chocolate processor, that you can be just accidentally supporting something like child exploitation and child labor. Mm -hmm. So it's a real shame. You don't know what you've never heard. So you know, mm -hmm. thanks again. Yeah, and so that brings me to my next point, which is most recently we we've, we've been working on the garment campaign, which is a campaign to raise awareness about where our clothes come from. So it's a very similar thing when you go into a store. The last thing that you're thinking about, or most people are thinking about, is where their clothing is coming from. And just recently, with the Bangladesh collapse, building collapse, where over 1,200 lives were lost, it really has started a lot of conversations globally about the garment industry and where yeah. our clothes are actually coming from. So we are working in the Burlington community to try to raise awareness about about that. Mm -hmm. Source it out of. Because there are so if you if you if you purchase clothing, or at least a, a certain percentage of your clothing that's not coming from um, basically sweatshop areas, mm -hmm. are, are entire areas of the world suspect? Or, or can you pick and choose? Is it even possible? Unfortunately, right now, I think that there are sections of the world, global regions, such as China, where you look at the label and you have an immediate negative connotation, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that by asking questions when you're in a retailer, that we can trace that line all the way back and hold retailers responsible, and hopefully change that, change that pattern so that in the future, when you think when you see made in China, you don't immediately think, yeah. "Oh no, that was made in a sweatshop." Um, yeah, because we're voting. The, probably the most democratic thing we do is actually vote with our money every Definitely. day. Mm -hmm. So every dollar you spend, kind of, you're voting for the way you want the world to look, mm -hmm. literally by going to the store. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And by letting those stores know, too, when you look at a tag and you see that it's made in Thailand or Bangladesh or China or India, asking where it's from and mm -hmm. making your voice heard, being vocal about it, so that that clerk who may seem unimportant will ask their manager and their manager will have to get an answer and so they'll ask their manager and it goes to the regional chain and then all the way up to corporate. So right. I really think that just by asking questions we can really make a difference. Yeah. And by starting conversations. Mm -hmm. So part of our campaign was that we went on Church Street and we started asking people, where are your clothes from? Asking them to check their tags and just see, just, just see where their clothes were from. And we wanted to determine the top three places that Burlington buys from. Yeah. And so after interviewing 150 people through a survey, we found that China is number one, India is number two, and USA is number three. It is. The USA would, is, was the third highest source for garments. Which is great. That is a good it's thing. It's wonderful. I really didn't expect that. And I'm proud of the Burlington community that that yeah. That was so that outcome. might not be the case in a bigger metro area or, or some place with more chains that would dominate the market. You think it would be higher um, and more like developing um, yeah, areas? I, or is know, that just guessing? I think that part of it was that we wanted to see if Burlington actually, actually kind of walked the walk, um, and they do. And so I guess my, my guess is as good as yours because I thought that we, we weren't going to have USA as number three. Mm -hmm. And another really interesting thing is that most of the people who had China on their tag said, well, it's from China, but I got this used. 
which mm -hmm. I deem as a socially responsible option for buying clothing because you're recycling. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, right, recycling that and it, as it becomes further from the source, mm -hmm. it becomes less and less critical. Yeah, and we, we live in such a consumer culture that we just tend to throw things away. So mm -hmm. by, by reusing something, you're... Yeah. Um, I, I personally, almost every garment I have has, has got that, is, you know, comes into my closet that way. That's great. So, and there's definitely no shame in that. Mm -hmm. Well, and right now there aren't too many. I mean, we did create a list, and if you go to our website, pjcvt.org, mm -hmm. we're going to put that list online of retailers that we found that were socially responsible. So there is a small list, and it's growing, and I think that it will get bigger as consumers demand for accountability in the clothing industry. Um, but until then, buying used clothes is a yeah. totally viable option. Yeah, there's good stuff out there. Mm -hmm, yeah. And we'll be having uh, a discussion next Monday at 6 p.m. about India. Mm -hmm. um, we just recently showed a, a movie on China. So China is, we've, we've had that discussion, and then we're going to have two more discussions. So next Monday will be India at 6 okay. o'clock at the Peace and Justice Center. At the Peace and Justice Center. Mm -hmm. And what's on the August address of that again? It's 60 Lake Street. It's just right by the waterfront. Lake Street at the Burlington Waterfront. Mm -hmm. And then the week after that, on Monday at 6 o'clock, we'll be having a discussion about the United States and consumer consumer um, patterns in the United States and how we might be able to change that. Neat. Good for you guys. I mean, that's what it takes is people mm -hmm. getting involved and then using your brain yeah. that was given to you to actually use and then make good decisions. Well, yeah. thanks again, Carmen, for yeah. coming on. I hope you, you will visit us again. Mm, yes, me too. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. <laughs> and thank you to the Peace and Justice Center of Vermont. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Critical Mass TV. And thank you for tuning in, and we hope to see you again. Have a great day. Have you let it get you People say, how bad's it going to get? I've been calling to the sky.